Um, okay, guys, let's uh, jump into this. Um, so I have been working on more work we're going to go over this week, so I did not get a chance to grade um, the tunnel assignment retouching yet, any of that stuff. Whatever. I will get to it this week, though, so don't worry. You'll still have a chance to um, – you will get, you'll get feedback on it, the whole nine yards. But I want to pick up where we left off uh, yesterday, uh, last time we were together. So this is my plan. Um, there's a couple of loose ends that I want to make sure we get to. I'm fairly confident that we can get to this before our break this morning, and then we will start branding as soon as we get back, and that will go through for the rest of this week or moving down that road. So that's the plan. Um, uh, but there's a number of things that I want to make sure you guys understand and are at least are exposed to. Um, so if, if I lose an hour here or there, whatever, it's not going to make a complete difference in the uh, end of things. Actually taken a black shirt and turned it white and then we actually turned it different colors feeling relatively good about that part that whole experience we all remember that part um, the recipes for that are in a PDF that is both on, in the assignment folder but it's also on our um, uh, on our website so please download them, stick them someplace where you know you can find them. So even if you can't remember how to do certain things, you can say to yourself, oh yeah, I remember we went over that and you can go find them and it will make your life. Uh, we're going to do a different version of this. That's where we're going to start today. And we're going to do sort of the opposite. We're going to take a white shirt and we're going to recolor it. It's a different process. So I just want to make sure that everybody has, um, uh, has had exposure um, to both of these. So to do that, Again, I think this was inside um, our uh, assignment session 11, I believe, but let me look here really quickly and I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, there's two uh, files in there, at least there's two in mind. The one I want you to do is shirt light version 2. If you can open that one up, that would actually be great. <clears throat> Um, so again, in the case of this, I've actually uh, gone ahead and jump-started us and I've built a few things um, for us to work with. Um, so I've got, if you take a, has everybody got this, could you all find this? So it's in session 11. It's called White Shirt, or Shirt Light version 2. There's two files in there. Make sure you open up the version 2 and please. Okay, so with this guy open, um, again, I've done a little bit of handiwork ahead of uh, the game for you. Nothing that you guys wouldn't know how to do. I've simply knocked the white shirt out of the white background, and I've also isolated the labels and, I think, the buttons. So if we take a look in the channels palette all the way on the left-hand side, and you scroll down to the bottom, you'll actually see that there are three different um, channels, one that has the buttons on it, one that has the labels on it, and one that actually has the shirt on it as well. So I want these all, again, what, what they're designed to do is allow me to change only the color of the shirt. I don't want to change the color of the background, I don't want to change the color of the buttons, and I don't want to change the color of the, of the, um, uh, of the uh, labels either. So with that in mind, I'm going to come over here again. This is, the whole process of this starts out pretty similar to the way it did for um, doing the black shirt to white. Is everybody good on this? Okay. Um, so it starts with changing, with converting this uh, image from an RGB image to an LAB image. So up to the image menu, down to mode, and change this to LAB color. And again, the reason we're doing that is if you were to stay, I mean, you guys know this already, if, you were to stay, if, you were, if you're working for doing color correction in RGB, you never just change the color. When you actually put a curve on an RGB image and you pull one of those red sliders down or push it up with the blue or whatever, you not only change the color, but you change the tone, and that complicates things for us. We don't want to change the tone of this. We want the shadows to be as deep as the shadows are. We want the highlights to be where the highlights are. We simply want to recolor it. So by going into an LAB workspace, we separate the color from the luminosity. That's the trick. That's what we're trying to do here. If you were to do this, and you can try it on your own. I don't want to take the time here to do it today. Um, you can do this exact same thing, but don't convert it to an LAB. And you will get pretty close, but you'll see what happens is, is that in the shadows specifically, they start to glow. And it's this really unnatural shadow-like quality. It does, it, it does not look real. 
Um, and it is a consequence, again, of this changing tonality um, uh, along with color when you actually do it. Um, so at any rate, um, okay, so we're gonna create a new group on top of this, and just a blank group on top of this. So I'm gonna click to on the, um, uh, the, um, the thing that looks like a folder icon, and I'm going to rename it new color. And then I'm going to apply a layer mask to this. And I'm going to do the shirt first. So I'm going to come over to the shirt and I'm going to command click on the shirt. It loads it as a selection. Again, I'm not selecting the shirt channel. Just command click on the icon. Back over to our new color here and I'm going to click on add layer mask. And it puts on a layer mask. And again, this is exactly what we want it to do. It is going to protect the background and it's going to change the color of the shirt. However, I now need to add the buttons and the labels to this. I want to do that. what does the mask need to look like if the labels and the buttons were actually on it already? What would the label and the buttons be like on the mask? They would be black. They would be black. Why? It would be inverted so you would, the white shows the image of the black. So I'm trying to protect them. I don't want the label to change color and I don't want the buttons to change color. So they need to be black on my mask, right? Command click to load the labels. Back over to your mask for the group and simply fill that with black. And you can see the little labels are now filled with black, protecting them. Do the very same thing for the buttons. Come up to the buttons channel, command click to load those as a selection. Back over to your uh, mask for this group and again, fill those guys with black. And you can see the mask that we're looking for. Now, if for some reason it ended up being wrong or somehow like that, whatever, you can go through other gyrations of actually doing it, but these are correct. Okay, so our next move again, and this is very similar to um, uh, uh, what we had done make a copy of this background. So simply click and drag it down to the dog ear guy to make a copy of it, and then drag it up on top of the group. And you can tell it's gonna drop into the group because I've got that blue line that's surrounding the entire layer and let go and you'll notice that the group, I mean that the uh, image itself just popped over slightly to the right. This is an indication that it actually is inside this group. To make sure it's inside the group, collapse the group and you'll see that that guy disappears. So now you know for certain that this is within this group and it's actually being, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that anything that we do inside of this group is actually going to function uh, uh, the way we want it to be. Does this make sense for everybody so far? Are we good on this part? Okay, same thing, we're gonna do this before. We're gonna desaturate this image. Here, you can take the head of the pack. If you want, Marguerite. You don't be, you're not in the screen. It's up to you. Um, so, next move uh, is, again, we had this conversation before, is that you do not want to try to introduce a new color with an existing color. It is much easier to start to add a color to something that is neutral than to add a color to something that's already colored. So for instance, if I wanted to get Connor's t-shirt color, it's so much easier for me to start without Jose's t-shirt color. If I was trying to change Jose's color to Connor's, I would wanna strip all that green out of Jose's color first and then simply add Connor's color to it. It's so much simpler than trying to actually take this green and make it that pink. Make sense? So that's the deal. You guys okay back there? Thanks. With that being said, select the white shirt that's inside of the group. Come up to the image menu, down to adjustments, down to desaturate. And again, the black shirt, you don't really notice any change in this because there's really no color in here. So the move we made is, is pretty uh, transparent. You're not really gonna see it. I have a problem. What's my problem? What did I just do wrong? Say, so, well, I, I have a selection. So what I just did was I just desaturated the buttons, which is not what I want to do. So I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that, Command D to select, and then on this entire image in here, back up to the image menu, down to adjustments, down to desaturation, and it will. Everybody else. So, so far this has been very close to what we've actually done uh, on all this before, but this is where things diverge off and we change into something else. 
We're going to add a solid color to this now above this. So again, it's the same trick that we did before. So it's an adjustment layer up to solid color. And in our case, I'm going to go to that same. You remember, um, it may still be, no, it's not still up on the board. You remember the color that we were using for the shirt before? It was a Pantone 190U. It was a Pantone 190 uh, uh, uncoated. So we're going to... Color. Mine's already showing right here. So I'm not on the screen at all. Simply type in the number quickly, 190. Group again in your drop down menu here, you need to be in the solid. So this is the color that I'm And I'm going to write down those same numbers again. I'm just going to write them on the back of my screen. I'm looking for the LAB numbers. So the LAB numbers are L is uh, 70, uh, B, I'm sorry, A is 49, and B is 9. Those are the target numbers that I need to go for. That LAB is Pantone 190U. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. And now this is where things change pretty dramatically. In the blending mode of this layer, we are going to click on the drop down menu and we are going to take it from normal down to multiply. And you can see it does a fair job of recoloring this shirt. However, in my case, I need to make sure that it's been recolored correctly. So I'm going to, again, grab the uh, color uh, sampler tool and I'm gonna come here right into an area in the middle. We talked about this before as well. Um, I'm gonna pick an area here that's sort of a general area. I don't want something that's a really highlight. I don't want something that's a real shadow. I want something that really represents the general color of what this shirt should be. And I'm simply going to click on that point and I look at my readout values up here and I can see that they're extremely close in this. Again, my values were supposed to be 70, 49, and nine. So I can tweak this in a final way. So I'm gonna simply add a color curve to this. So again, I'm adding adjustment layer and I'm gonna add a curve. And in the lightness group to begin with, again, is the, you don't get a composite channel here. You simply have the LAB channels. L stands for lightness. Click on the targeting adjustment tool. It's this guy right here. You'll see when you're using the targeting adjustment tool, it's actually setting points on, your, on the slider that's up here. So for instance, if I hover over the dark, you'll see way down in the shadow tones. If I come to the white button, it sets it to the top hover over the point that I actually selected uh, mid -tones, quarter tones. Uh, and I'm going to click on this and simply push my uh, uh, cursor up until that L reads um, 70 because this is the value that I copied down then I'm going to come down to my A channel and I'm going to do the same thing again I'm going to click on this guy and bump it up till I get to 40 your arrow keys if you want. Again, in this case, it's really tough to get to 49. I'll see if I can do it just using my mouse. But if you're within a point, you should be all right. Yeah, close enough for government work. Uh, and then the B channel. And again, the B channel is supposed to be a nine. So let's actually click on that and add a nine to that. Perfect. And this is now exactly that color. So in the bigger scheme of things, when we talk about recoloring stuff, Avoiding the extremes is really pretty much the easiest. Um, if I had dark colored uh, clothes, I would want probably a darker version of it. If I wanted light colored clothes, I would go with a lighter version. It's somewhat easier not to work with blacks and whites, but these examples give you the extreme. I want to do one more of these really quickly, so do me a favor, collapse this group right here. Double click on the name that says new color. 190 capital U, the color. And I want you to drag that down to the dog ear guy to make a brand new copy of the group. Close uh, or turn off the eyeball for the one that we just made and open up the other one. So um, again, I'm simply opening uh, up. I'm going to turn the curve off temporarily and I'm going to then click on the new color on the solid color part. I want to pick a different color here because I want to show you guys something else. Yeah, it's this one right here. So I want everybody to go for a 345U. So again, I'm going to pick something here and type in 
and I'm in the U group in the, the drop part down, you see that there's actually a negative value in here. And this is the scale that you need to remember when you're working in LAB. When we work in LAB as far as our tonal range goes, so this is different. Again, when you're working in RGB, you're not going to see this on the screen, but you'll hear it hopefully on the recording. Um, when we're talking about L, L is a percentage. So it runs on a scale of 0% up to 100%. So it's a brightness scale. That's all it is. So that's its scale. Zero is bright, 100 is white, 50 is middle gray. Uh, you know, you guys get this. 75 is a, three, is a quarter tone. 25 is a three quarter tone. Does that make sense to everyone? But the tricky part is on the A scale and the B scale, what they do is, if I'm going to show you the middle of the scale right now. If you, okay, so remember, I always remember this by the B channel. So B stands for blue. So this, the B channel is the blue to yellow range. And the A channel is uh, magenta, or yeah, uh, magenta to green. So is magenta the opposite of green, the complement of green? It is. And is blue the complement of yellow? It is. So if you go right to the middle of these scales, what happens is you have a value of zero. Zero sits in the middle of the scale. If you have the zero and the A, you have neither, green, um, neither magenta or green. You don't have either one. They've neutralized each other out. You have a middle gray. If you do the same thing in the blue range, or the B channel right here, again, they balance each other out. Zero is right in the middle between blue and yellow. It is also a neutral color. Then you have a positive direction up to 127 and a negative direction down to a, a minus 128. And the same thing happens in this. You have a plus up to 127 and a minus down to a minus 128. This 128 plus the zero plus the uh, 250, uh, 127 gives us our range of 256 tones in an 8-bit image. Does that make sense? That's we now have a negative value in one of these. In this um, A channel right here, we have a negative value because it is indicating here. So that would actually mean these are the opposite. Green's on the other side. So this is green to magenta. Okay. So again, I'm going to copy these values down. I have all of 77, uh, minus 30. That's the color I'm going to make on this one. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK to the color. It gives us a good beginning of it. Then I'm going to turn on my eyeball. Again, I've still got my color picker. It's exactly in the same spot I want it to be. I'm going to click on the curve to actually make it active. But this curve was designed to fix the, the, that pinkish color that we did in the very beginning. To get it back to having nothing with it, simply click on this little reverse arrow right here. That will get rid of all the points. Or come to the very top of this drop-down menu and simply pick default. And then we're going to do the exact same thing again. In my lightness channel, I'm going to click on the targeting adjustment tool. I'm going to come over here and click on this guy. My target is 77. I've got a 74 right here. So I'm going to click and drag up. And that's my 77. I'm going to go to my A channel. And again, targeting adjustment tool, I'm going to click on this guy and drag down because I'm looking for 37, uh, minus 37. And then finally, I'm going to go to the B channel right here, and I'm going to, it's reading 14, and it should be a 15. The colors are always really close because, again, you've divorced the, um, um, the uh, luminosity from the color. And I'm either going to be at 15, I mean, at 16 or 14, but at any rate. So this is now my new color for this guy. So I'm going to come up to the top, <clears throat> collapse that channel, and I'm going to rename this 345U. How long did it take us to do that? You guys can do this all day long. And this is how every catalog house ultimately does these things. They, don't, they shoot one of them, and they do all the coloring in post. So I know some of you guys are thinking, well, I'm not ever going to be doing that kind of work. But the truth of it is, 
You can use this on anything. You can change the color of a building. You can change the color of sky. You can change the color of, of if we were looking at um, uh, some of the stuff that we were looking at earlier, um, you can change the color of leaves. If you can select the leaves, you can make them any color you want. So in some of the work that we were doing with the girl in the woods, I actually had changed all those leaves. That way it wasn't fall. It was spring. I changed all those leaves to fall. Make sense? So all of this becomes available to you guys, and it's pretty flawless. Are we good on this? All right, you can close this guy up. I can check that off the list. For the short work, um, what are some good selection methods? Like for the buttons, if you just do a circle marquee? Yeah, exactly. That's, yes, that's exactly what I would do. Um, if I got, if, again, if it wasn't going really well for me quickly, really quickly, I would hit it all with the pen tool. Again, I, I, all I can say is you guys have enough experience with the pen tool. You know it doesn't take that long, but there's a resistance. And to me, even to this day, even though I know it's the best thing to go after or the fastest, people will sit there and everybody's first shot is with the quick selection tool and it doesn't really work. So then they try to refine it with a brush and that doesn't really work either. And then all of a sudden you're into it for a half hour and if you'd used the pen tool, it would have been 15 minutes, it would have been perfect and you'd be gone. So just bite it and use it. All right, you don't need to save that. Um, the next one I want to open up really quickly is we need to talk about what I think is a preferred way to actually do um, um, uh, uh, contrast boosting for it for everything. Actually, let me see what you guys have in your folder really fast. Do you guys have a fabric retouch PSD in your file? Double click on that guy. We're not going to do it for fabric. We're going to do it for something else. So <clears throat> um, I typically do this. Well, this all started out as a method to do beauty uh, 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 contrast or beauty. Um, and if you zoom into this girl's face, you can actually see she has a little bit of shine on her face. You can also see she's a little why is that? Film scan. So you would be shocked. Well, I am shocked. After working for a decade in digital, when you go back and actually look at your film and what your film cameras can really resolve, there's, they're nowhere near as sharp as a digital lens on a sensor. They just aren't. Uh, there's just too much shit going on. So at any rate, um, it's in I called that. OK, but at any rate. We can back off on all of this um, because it's really more about doing contrast on this. So typically when people want to put contrast on an image like this, they would simply, again, they would come down, they would add a curve. So everybody do this with me. They would add a curve on this. And again, if you pull down your shadows slightly and boost your highlights slightly, it makes the shadows brighter. It makes the highlights darker. I'm sorry, it makes the shadows darker and the highlights brighter. There's a series of custom, uh, I mean custom, they're canned uh, versions of contrast right here. So you can put on linear contrast. If you let go, you'll see that's the shape of the curve. It's relatively subtle. There's a medium contrast. You'll see it puts in a heavier version of that curve. There's a strong contrast. It puts even in a heavier version of that curve. In the case of all of these guys, they pervert the color pretty well. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask you guys to put on strong contrast. But then the trick to this, to avoid perverting the color and only affecting the tone, is to use a blending mode for this curve. So click on your drop down menu and come all the way down to luminosity. And you can see now that it has impacted the contrast. It's again made the highlights lighter, the shadows darker, uh, and because we're using a luminosity blending mode, it's only affecting tone. It's not affecting um, uh, 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 the RGB values of this, the color values of this. Interestingly enough, since it's treating it as an LED image. That's how it's doing this math. That's what's going on in here. So um, in my opinion, though, that doesn't necessarily look really all that good. And there's a better way, I think, of doing contrast. And I started doing this with beauty. And it, it's now the way I do contrast on everything. So I want to show you guys right now. I'm going to throw this curve away. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to come over to our RGB channel and hold down the Command key and click C loaded the luminosity of this image. If you come up to the select menu and you come down to save selection, 
and save it. Just call it luminosity, L-U-M-I-N-O, because I can't spell luminosity. Hit Command D to deselect and go look at it. It's sitting right down here. The luminosity channel of this. It is the brightness scale of it. So you can see the areas in here that are light were more selected. The areas in dark are less selected. This is just like a mask. We have done this all along. Is everybody good on that part, what's going on here? Just because it looks like an image, it's not really that. It is the luminosity of this image. Does that make sense, everyone? All right, you can throw the, uh, the channel away that we just made. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to leverage that. So I'm going to throw this guy away. And I'm going to then do the exact same move again. I'm going to go all the way up to the top. I'm going to hover over the RGB guy. I'm going to command click to load this as a selection. And then I'm going to come back to this image layer right here, my background layer. And I'm going to hit command J. I'm going to jump that selection to its own layer. And if you turn off the background now, you'll see what ended up happening. The area that was lightest and most heavily selected, it's copied the majority of that image content. The area that was darker, like in her hair, which was hardly selected at all, very little of that uh, uh, detail information has actually gotten brought into here. Her face, which is kind of up in the quarter tones, is like halfway selected. So is the wall on the side over here. Her shoes are dark, so they are not selected. There's panels down here. Does that make sense what's going on here? So what does this image information represent? These are my highlights. And I'm going to call them that. Double click on this and call it highlights. So come over to RGB. Don't, yeah. Hold down your command key, click on the icon, and then back over here and hit command J. And, yeah, and that is now highlights. So does everybody have highlights? Okay, we're going to do the same trick again. However, you need to come back down to your original background layer because what I'm going to go after. Selected, you're going to try to select the shadows in your highlight layer, and there aren't any. So, again, I'm going to come back over to RGB, command click to load it as a selection. This is now loaded my highlights. I want the shadows. So, to do that, you invert the selection up to the select menu, down to inverse. These now are the shadows are being selected. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, so again, coming back over to your background copy, make sure it is active. Command J and double click on that and call it shadows. And say OK. To take a look at that, hold down the Option key and simply click on its You can see that this is the shadows. You can see none of the um, white wall windows things, none of that was selected. This is all transparent. You can definitely see the detail in her hair was uh, selected in this. The little shadow edges that are running along her arm. We've got her feet and the shoes are in now. We've got those dark shadow lines that are underneath and the ones that describe the outside of the, of the uh, window sill framing things. Um, her eyes are in here. Her lips are in here. This is the shadow content of my image. Does that make sense? All right, so then here's the trick. I'm going to put both of these into their own and I'm going to call it contrast. So I'm going to turn on the highlights, I'm going to turn on the shadows, and I'm going to turn on my bottom guy right here. So everything is on. Nothing, your image doesn't look any different at all. However, I'm going to select the shadows, hold down the shift key, and select the highlights. These are both now active, and I'm going to put them into their own group. You come up to this drop-down menu, click on the drop-down part, and you want to say new group from layers, and it's going to offer you to name it, and I'm going to call it contrast. So, is everybody up to speed on this? Are we all good? All right. Uh, and this is how it works. Go ahead and open up the group. You need to select the highlight layer first, and we are going to change its blending mode to screen. And you'll notice screen brightens up everything in the image, which is exactly what we want to do with the highlights. Come down to the shadows, and we're going to do the opposite on the shadows. We're going to make them darker. To do that blending mode, it's the opposite of screen. It is multiply. So click on multiply. This is now the contrast that we've actually built into this image. And it's built on image content, not only on tonal structure, but literally on the image content. So nothing in these highlights. The highlights are all getting brighter. The shadows are all getting darker. However, if I were to do it simply with a curve, that curve affects the entire tonal range. That is not what is happening here. Does that make sense? 
Now, in most cases, now this is not a law, but in most cases, what I have discovered is, is that you want the strength of the move and your shadows to be half of what it is in your highlights. Now, again, this is not a hardcore rule. I've looked at images here and I've completely turned off the highlights or I've completely turned off the shadows, whatever. But usually that ratio of two to one actually ends up being really good. And that's part of why I put these into a group. I'm gonna click on my shadow uh, uh, layer to actually make it active. And I'm gonna drop its opacity down to 50%. Now I've got that two to one ratio. I've got twice the impact because my highlights are still at 100%, but only half of the impact of the shadows. Does this make sense to everyone? Are we good on this part? But now the icing on the cake. Now you can collapse these two. You can use the opacity slider of the entire group to drop the whole contrast down or to crank it back up. And the advantage of this now is that two to one ratio of shadow to highlight impact is being maintained. However, I can now use the opacity slider of the group to have that impact, that relationship over the entire thing. So if I crank it all the way down to zero, I've turned it off. If I've cranked it all the way up to 100%, is this the most I can do? Is this the strongest it can be? How do I make it stronger? Exactly. If I need this to be stronger, I can duplicate the contrast group and you'll see it pops it even more. And then I could go in and adjust the contrast of that. Oh, that was too much. I needed the first one to be full on and I need this one to only be part way there. But in my case, I don't believe that's true. I don't think I needed more, but I just want everybody to know that that's a possibility. But now look at what's going on in here. When you want to talk about how you create shine and beauty, turn your contrast group on and off and you'll see exactly what shine and beauty, where it all comes from. Guys, people, everybody I know, food photographers, landscape photographers, portrait photographers, everybody I know, this is how they do contrast after they've seen it the first time. You cannot get this with a curve. Make sense? All right. You can close that guy up. You don't need to save him. All right, next image. Let me see what's actually in 12. There may be some better files for us to work with in 12. Um, Yeah, in 12, let's just go ahead and we'll see what it looks like. Can you open up that profile one that we just did? So this is the profile one that we've been working with before. Now, when I look at this, I don't think the skin is especially uh, retouched all that well, but nonetheless, actually, hang on one second. Let's see if I can find something else a little better. No, let's just go with that. All right, so down into 12. And uh, yeah, it's the profile one, the profile copyright 2007, Tammy uh, Peloso, Peluso. Okay, so with this image open, so let's say you've done all of your softening work, all, not softening work, you've done all your beautiful retouching, you've used frequency separation, you've gotten everything, it's looking great, the skin looks amazing, and then you're ready to actually put this out either online or you're gonna go to print with this. And in most cases here, well this is actually be a good time to install this. So have any of you installed uh, Nick Sharpener software yet? Okay, we'll actually get to that in the afternoon. We'll do that more in a printing session than we will here. So um, let's just say that you've done all this, you know, you've got the skin looking amazing and then you get ready to print this thing out or to put it online and you go in and it's your final step in this, you sharpen the hell out of it. And so everything that you did to sort of soften that skin up, you've just undone because you now just sharpened it and brought all that, that, all the pores and detail, all that shit back. 
Does that sort of make sense? So I tend to want to avoid that part. So I'm going to show you how I would do this. So for me, the first thing you want to do is copy the layer. If you have, let's say you had a bunch of layers on here. Let's do one other thing really quickly. Let's just put a, a curve on here. And we're not going to do anything with it. But let's just say I'm just trying to give you the illusion that we've done a whole lot of work. We've got tonal layers on here. We've got pixel layers on here. We've got, we've got all those layers on there, right? Well, when it comes then time to sharpening, you need to sharpen the entire image, or at least the entire, all the components of the image. Maybe not the entire image, but all the components of it. So to do that, make sure you've got your very top layer selected. Hold down Command, Option, Shift, and hit the letter E. And you will get a merge stamp of everything on the top. So all of your tonal work, all your pixel work, all, your, all of that work gets merged into one layer at the top. And we're going to label this guy sharpening. And say okay to that. So then the trick to this is, for me, what I would do right now is I would actually change this, convert this into a smart object, because again, the sharpening is a filter. And so if it's a smart object, it will then allow us to go back and adjust it after the game. Does that make sense for everyone? So that's what I'm going to do. Change it into a smart object, convert to smart object. And then we are actually going to run a sharpening filter on this. I'm going to zoom in so that I can sort of see her uh, face and her, and her eye like this. I'm going to come up to the filter and I'm going to come down to sharpen. Now there's a whole range of sharpenings that people can use that some people use. In the old days, everybody would use unsharp mask. How many of you people are still using unsharp mask? Okay, then the sort of newer on steroid version of that is smart sharpen. How many people use that? How many people don't sharpen their files at all? Okay, that's got to change because again, if you're going to print, why do you have to print? Why do you have to sharpen something going to print? So we need to talk, it's a printer term, we need to have this conversation. What is dot gain? Anyone know? It is. It is. So imagine a piece of paper, printing paper, it looks just like this, except it isn't yellow. And I spray it with a liquid. What's going to happen? It works like a sponge. The liquid hits this and it bleeds out into the surrounding area. Now, Unsized papers, matte papers, tend to have a higher dot gain. They bleed more. Glossy papers tend to be coated and they have a finer surface on them. They tend to bleed less. You can't predict dot gain. You've, it's all dependent on the piece of paper. That's why you sharpen for one kind of paper different than you sharpen for another kind of paper. But the trick to sharpening is this. If I know that this is going to bleed out and soften my image, then I over sharpen my file to counteract that. So my file on screen looks too sharp, but when it's printed out, the bleed softens up the over sharpening. And if you get that right, your prints look just like your unsharpened file does on your screen. Does that make sense, everyone? So if you're going to print, you should be sharpening. That's all I'm going to say. So, so which kind of paper is more matte paper? Matte paper is much worse than glossy. Again, the, the, the more textured it is, the finer the material, the more it'll bleed. Yes? I think you talked about it before, but um, I've always used high pass sharpening. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at the different versions of it, and that is completely a viable option for this, right? But I'm going to show you guys the, what I think is the ultimate way to do it. Uh, uh, probably but at any rate, the conversation that I want to have right now is about this. We're I'm going to use uh, unsharp filter, uh, unsharp ma uh, mask because I just want to hit this really hard. I want to hit this overly hard so you guys can see what's going on. So I'm going to grab the sharpening filter. I'm going to come down to unsharp mask. It's sitting on here. I'm going to crank the amount up to 200. And I'm going to do a radius of 2. And you can see it's going to be grossly over sharpened. Yeah, I would say that's not what you want. However, it points out a number of really interesting possibilities or things to consider in this. One of them is haloing. Have you guys ever heard about haloing and sharpening? This is a perfect example of haloing right here. You can see it right here all around her, uh, her uh, eyelashes right here. If you zoom in really close to this and you take a look at what's going on at her eyelashes right here, you can use your preview to turn this on and off. You can see what's happening is, is that sharpening is actually a contrast move. There's nothing to go in here and really focus your filter after, I mean your lens after the fact. That doesn't work. 
But what it does, what this is doing is, is that it's adding contrast, specifically edge contrast, but in this case, it's contrast over the entire image. And it gives the appearance of your image being sharper. Does that sort of make sense? So I'm gonna leave this up here. I'm gonna leave it here as overkill, and I'm simply gonna say okay to this. Um, I'm gonna leave my threshold at zero and say okay. And clearly, if we back out of this, you can see that this was like way too strong in, in this. It actually makes her look uh, like old. Um, so I need to control this. In some areas of this, I actually may want to It's too strong all over whatever, but I wanted to just show that part. But really, I'm going to create a skin mask for this. So to do that, I'm actually going to come over to the quick selection tool. We'll see how good this guy does. I'll do the quick selection tool. And I'm just going to see if I can get a quick outline of her face. Now, you could try this. And again, I've never had this tool work for me, but I just want everybody to know that this exists. Instead of doing the quick selection tool first, you could try up to the select menu, down to color range. And when color range opens up, you can come down to skin tones. And you can see what it does, but the problem is, is that our background is so close to skin tones, this isn't really gonna work for me. So I'm gonna hit cancel out of, um, actually let's try something else. Come up to your sampled colors, and let's just click on the skin itself and see what it does. So I'm simply gonna click on the skin. Um, I've got a fuzziness of about a 29, if you guys want your image to look like mine. Again, to get your image to be the same readout as the little baby preview in here, you wanna click this drop down menu and set it to grayscale. Then I'm gonna actually click on the plus slider and I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna click another of her skin tones right here. And that's actually not too bad for me given what's going on here. It's giving me a reasonably good line, I think here. Um, so uh, this would be one way that we could actually go about doing this. I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's, well, I'm gonna try a quick selection tool first and see how well it does. So I just canceled out of that. I'm gonna come up to the quick selection tool, not the, magic wand, the quick selection tool, and I'm simply going to click. And all I'm hoping is, is that it's going to hit her profile. That's all I really care about in this. And in my case, it actually did pretty good. I'm going to leave, I'm going to go, actually, I'm going to leave the hair out of, the, it, there's some hair that's in here, there's some hair that isn't. There's a small little bit of background that got clipped right down here that I'm going to actually get rid of. I'm going to make my brush a little bit smaller. Hold down the option key to get the negative tool and simply paint in in that area right here. Same thing in here, make my brush even smaller. And run it, oh, sorry. And that'll be good enough because, again, this is strictly a mask to control sharpening. So areas that are not perfect aren't going to be the end of the world. So this is the mask that I'm going to begin to do here for my sharpening part. So I'm going to save this. So everybody should have a reason. And you'll see it's not a perfect selection, but it does include her ear. It includes a little bit too much hair. But anyway, I'm going to save this part. So to do that, I'm going to come up to the select menu, come down to save selection, and I'm going to call it skin. And say okay, command D to deselect, then we need to modify this guy. So I'm going to turn on the skin mask so I can actually see that part right now. But I wanna be able to see the image that's underneath. I need to actually refine this mask so that it really reflects the image that's exactly underneath this. Does that make sense, everyone? So to do that, you wanna leave the skin selected. You can see this channel, it is selected, it's highlighted. But if you go up to the top, do not select the RGB channel. You just want to turn its eyeball on. And when that happens, you get this red thing that's on your image. This is actually like, does anybody in here use Quick Mask? It's very similar to Quick Mask. It's, uh, um, it ultimately would do roughly the same thing for us. But I point this out because this happens to people all the time. What's going on here now is, is that you've got one image is actually, one of these channels is selected, but you've got two eyeballs on. And that's giving us this red view. It's actually named after, uh, in the printing industry years ago, they used to do, people used to do this by hand. They would take, um, and you guys, does anybody here do printing? Katie, did you ever do any print, like silk screen printing? Yeah, anybody else? You guys ever work with Ruby Lith or Amber Lith? 
they're hand cut stencils. So basically it's a clear sheet of acetate that's got a film on it that's either yellow, uh, red like this or, or an orange color. And you, you, take an, you put it down onto something that you want to trace and you take an X-Acto knife and you pierce just the, the layer of lacquer, colored lacquer that's on the outside of the acetate. And then you peel that off. The acetate supports everything else. And essentially you're building a negative. That's what it does, and that's what we're doing here. So at any rate, we need to refine this. Hit the B key to get a brush. Make sure that your brush is um, medium hard. Actually, I'm going to take mine down a little bit harder still. I'm going to put mine around in the, in the low 70s. Um, click on the drop down menu. It needs to be normal percent, uh, I mean a normal blending mode, 100% opacity, 100% flow. We need to change certain things in this. So I'm going to make this brush bigger and I can never remember which one of these to start with. In my case, black is my foreground color. I've got to, I've got to uh, get this hair out of this skin mask right now. So I'm going to click and drag across that and yes indeed, that was the correct one. So I'm just changing this up like this. Uh, I'm going to then make my brush smaller and much smaller. I'm going to zoom into the area that is her mouth and I'm going to paint out her mouth. Again, just her lips. I'm going to come to her nose and I'm going to paint out her nostril. I'm going to not paint out the edge of that nose right there because I don't want that to be sharpened. I'm going to paint her entire eye. Her eyebrow. What I'm doing is I'm picking out the areas that I actually want to be sharpened with this brush. I'm going to kick back out and I probably, even though it won't really matter, there's a hair in the very back here, so I need to make a larger brush for that. And then finally, little details like her earring, I would probably come in and tap that guy as well. And this is my quick down and dirty hair mask. If you want to see what it looks like, turn the eyeball off on the RGB channel and back back out. And this is actually a pretty, oh wait, I didn't fill in the whole eye. So this whole area in between here, all of this needs, the entire eye needs to be uh, filled in. So all of this needs to be filled in. Again, another reason for checking your masks because that's what's going on here. And there's a little bit right there. Does everybody got something that looks something like this? They always look like this. Are we good on this part? So I can use this as a selection now, and I am going to do that. So I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to command click to load this as a selection. And I'm going to come over here to my unsharp mask. And again, my only option at this stage of the game is to fill this with black. Black is my foreground color. Option delete fills this. And you can see, command D to deselect. What I have now done is I have removed the sharpening from the skin. If you can look at this, you can see that as you, if you turn this guy on and off, that it is only sharpening the eyes, that the skin has been completely unaffected by this. Does that make sense, everyone? However, now I've got two options. One is I can actually double click on the unsharp mask to go back in to back it off because it's too strong on the eyes and on the hair. The problem with that is that when I'm actually in that, I, I don't have the benefit of seeing it against this unsharpened skin. I see all the skin, I see it all happening. So easier way is to simply take the opacity of this whole sharpening issue and simply drop it down. And I'm going to get it down to a part where I think it's about a little bit more reasonable. So I don't start really haloing until, yeah, so I'm around a 30% on this. And then you turn it on and off and you can see that is selective sharpening and that is exactly what you want to think about doing for the rest of your life. There is no point in taking something and trying to make it soft and turning right around and making it sharp again right before you put it out. Are there questions about this? All right, we can close that guy up. Uh, don't need to save that. There is another file. We're in session 12 now. There is a file in here. Uh, there's a folder in here called Moray Photos. Can you guys find that? What is Moray? It's kind of like the highlights of an image are... You see in different textures that there's a weird, like, 
texture over some textures? Yeah, yeah. It can be texture or color. It can be so this is a huge problem in digital cameras. So I need everybody to, there's one in here called uh, moray.jpg. If you can just open that up. This is a screen capture of a moray, of a photo shoot that I was actually doing, and this is a nightmare. That is moray. And what causes moray is this. And I mean, you guys have all seen this. If you're watching TV, you're watching the newscaster, and they always have on a striped tie, and the tie always starts to glow in these really weird colors. And then as they move, it, it looks, it's almost like it's alive. It's like it's electric. So what's happening is this. You have got a series, and the reason it's especially bad, it's much, much, much worse in digital than it is in film. So for all of you film lovers out there, one of the arguments you could always make about the reason you shoot film is because you don't have more like all the losers who are shooting digital. So what happens if you take a look at a sensor <clears throat> like this, a sensor has lines on it, and they're just lines of pixels, but it's one line after another, and there's thousands and thousands of them. Does that make sense? And what had, what's happening with this um, fabric right here is this is actually a tweed. Tweeds are the most notorious for this. Synthetic fabrics do this as well. Anything that you can get, the more precise the weave in it is, the more likely you are to have this problem. So in the case of this guy, it's actually got lines, depending on where you are, that are doing the same thing. It's a series of very thin lines like this. When you cross these two, it's like crossing a screen or a window screen over a window screen. As you start to move that stuff around, it creates these patterns called morays. If you go to your, everybody did this for me, they go to your website, go to any browser really fast, type in moray, M-O-I-R-E, and say okay, and hit, I'm gonna do videos to see if we can actually get a video of moray. Okay, Come on, just show it to me. No, oh, please. Forget the videos. Go to images. And yeah, this is a perfect one. I'll just select this guy right down here. You can actually see down here that hopefully this will give it to me. Nope. But this is the patterning that you actually get. And they shift. Does that sort of make sense what's going on here? And it's the reason they shift is this. And this is an important one for you guys to know. Is that the closer those lines are in size to one another, the worse this problem is. So to get rid of moray, and that is your job, I'm telling you this right now, to avoid moray is much, much, much better than to actually try to deal with it in post. So your two tricks, stop down as much as you can stop down. So for instance, in that image that I was showing you guys right here, I'm gonna jump out of this really quick. This image was actually shot at F8. When I stopped down to F16, the majority of this went away. How do I get from eight to 16 like that? I'm shooting in the studio, I got 30 lights. I go in and I change every one of them, right? I could just what? I'm shooting strobe, shutter speed won't have any impact at all. I need two stops more light, so how do I get it like that? Thank you. I'm shooting an ISO of 100, I change my ISO to, I need two stops more, what's my new ISO? 400, I don't have to change anything else. It's one little slider on, in Capture One and I'm no more A and I'm shooting, right? And then when it comes time to go to stuff that uh, don't need that uh, much uh, depth of field, I simply change my stop, uh, mesh, uh, ISO back. So at any rate, so your, so your number one trick is to stop down as much as you can. Your number two trick is to try to change the distance. So instead, uh, you can see that this is a shot that's supposed to be, it's just about the jacket from the waist up. But if I were to go much further away from this girl and shoot her full length and then crop in post, I've broken that scale. The scale of my image sensor lines are not as perfectly aligned with the weave that's in this fabric. So, and sometimes you do both. Make sense? But other times you get it and you can't know. So this is something you should know. 
Um, in this case, this was actually what my screen preview was in Capture One. The truth of the matter was, I really had no more ray in this. It all had to do with my screen resolution. My screen resolution is not the same as my final resolution. So if you do a focus check on this, your little focus check will, sh will go ahead and process this out at 100%. And if you see more, if you don't see more ray, then more ray there, you're good to go. It's just happening because the screen preview is drawing at a, uh, at a lower resolution and that lower resolution is matching up, but the real file itself isn't. Does that make sense? And that's not a bad thing. Where it is a bad thing is, is that if you don't see it in your preview, it might be in your final file. So again, you want to use your focus check on the fabric like this to make sure you're not getting it. Does that make sense to everyone? So the things you watch out for are tweeds, synthetics, anything that's got a pattern to it, anything that's got like a perfect weave to it, all of those things are, should be suspicious and on your radar. But in our case, there's another image in here called moraremoval.tiff. If you can actually bring that into Photoshop, I'm gonna show you how to get rid of some of it. So in this image, you need to zoom into her left boob and you'll see the worst of it. And it's sitting right here underneath it. You can see it looks like a target right here and it's got a lot of color in it. There are two kinds of moire. The first moire that I just showed you of the girl in the jacket, that is a pattern moire. It's much more difficult. The only way to get rid of pattern moire is to go in with the clone stamp tool or the healing brush tool or cut and paste or just you'll hate your life. That's all I can say, whatever. It'll take you, you know, three weeks to actually retouch. Your best bet is to simply reshoot it. Color moire is different though. Color moire we actually can get rid of. So to do that, it works like this. I need you to make a copy of this file. So simply grab on the uh, background copy, drag it down to make a copy. This is the new copy that I'm gonna work with. Then you need to come up to the filter menu, down to blur, down to Gaussian blur, and you need to hit this thing hard enough for that to disappear. So I'm continuing, I'm cranking up, and I'm watching primarily the, the, the bullseye right in the middle. That's the one I'm trying to get rid of. So at uh, 30, I've gone a little too far. At 20, you don't want to hit this any harder than you need to hit it, but you need to hit it hard enough. So for me, it's around uh, 18, 19, somewhere in there. How did you go? Where did you, go? Where did you guys land? Sort of in that range-ish. Does that work for you guys? Hello? <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, and then go ahead and say okay to that. So when you say okay to that, you've got this beautifully blurred image. You simply double click on the hand and that's what you hand your client. And you say, here you go. Got rid of the moire. No. Um, you need to then change the blending mode of this background copy, the blur copy from normal down to color. And you'll see that it indeed got rid of the moire. If you zoom into her boob again, you can actually see that. But, what, but I've got a problem. Look at the glow that's actually existing right around her skin. That part's not acceptable. So if you turn the eyeball on and off, you can actually spot where this is going. So instead, you need to restrict this only to the area of the suit. But if you go around looking on the suit, so I'm gonna turn mine off again. If you go around looking at the suit, you can actually spot there's color moire throughout the entire thing. It's everywhere. It's not in the little gold guy right here. It's not on her skin, but it is pretty much all over everything else in this suit. So for me, I'm gonna go ahead and turn, uh, I'm gonna leave the eyeball off right now for a second because I don't wanna work with a blurred edge, but I'm gonna see if the quick selection tool will build a quick selection of just the suit. So again, I'm gonna come to quick selection. I'm gonna start up here at the top, a little bit larger selection. Again, you don't want the quick selection tool to touch the edge you want it to find but it does a pretty good job because it's a good contrast edge against her. I'm not gonna worry too much about her fingers right there. If you don't want it to impact the little gold thing that's in medallion that's in the middle, hold down your option key and click on the little gold guy. Again, I would probably take a little bit more time and hit this with, the, um, uh, with a pen tool or something like that. So, but this is good enough for government work. Uh, and then simply add that to a layer mask for this background copy. So I'm simply gonna add layer mask. And you can see now that the only thing where this is, the only place where this mask is going to actually, uh, the softening or the color removal is gonna show up is on the suit itself. So now you can turn this um, uh, eyeball on. And now you can see up here at the top again, if you look at that area that's underneath, that's right on the side of her boob, um, the uh, color moire is gone, but I don't have that glow that's around the body. Does this make sense to everyone? Are we good on that part? All right, you can close this guy up. 
How many of you guys do any focus stacking, panorama, any of that kind of work at all? Yeah. Could be. All right. Well, we're going to show you how to do this. And the reason these become important, are, do any of you guys shoot landscape? Okay. Well, this might interest you then. I'm going to go ahead and close this up. If you come into our system, uh, 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 I'm sorry, session 12, week 12 again, you will actually see that there is a folder called Panorama Files. And if you click on that Panorama Files and then click on the very first one, you can see this is actually a Seth Resnick file. Um, this was, uh, Seth is, uh, he's one, if not the leading stock photographer in the country. Um, and he does uh, uh, um, workshops for Lightroom. And I took one of the workshop, and this is a working file from that uh, session. So I feel like I'm entitled to actually use this to show this to you guys. However, you should know that Seth is an absolute uh, hawk about uh, copyright and copyright infringement. So don't be putting this shit up on your website because he'll find you and he'll sue you and you just don't want to do that. But for our purposes, we're going to be fine actually uh, working uh, just with this file. So what this is, Seth lives in Miami. He went to the very top of his building and this is a shot from the top of his building. It's during sunset and from the very top of his building, he is facing southeast. So he's looking sort of like towards Cuba for this first shot. And then you can see he goes through it. He's simply panning around till he is now facing southwest and he sees sunset. So he is up on the top. So this is the worst of all ways to shoot panoramas, but this is what he's doing. Handheld, no tripod to like uh, orient a horizon line to do panoramas the way you should really be doing them. However, he's also got his camera on auto. So his exposure is changing. He starts to come over to the sun. His images are getting darker because the sun is coming into his uh, frame. So he starts off with one exposure, ends up with a completely different one. So handheld and a range of exposures, and we got to put this all down. So he has done this. He's held his camera, bang, 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 bang. That's all he's done. And these are the files. Make sense to everyone? OK, so we are going to turn this into a panorama. <clears throat> so to do this, there's a number of ways that you can do it, or a number of places you can do it out of. I'm going to do it primarily out of Photoshop. So here in Photoshop, if you come up to the File menu, and you come down to Automate, and you come down, sorry, Automate, down to Photo Merge, a dialog box will actually open up. I'm going to leave this on Auto. Um, and I'm going to leave all of these unchecked. And the reason this matters, you can leave the blend together. You do not want to add vignette remo removal on this. That usually makes things worse. Geometric distortion usually introduces geometric distortion, so you want to leave that off. And I'm going to show you what content aware transparent areas are in just a second. For the time being, I want you to leave that off as well. We can get through this before, um, uh, and we'll take a break. So click on Browse, and you need to navigate to those folders to that folder. So again, it's in our session 12. And it's inside the panorama files. Click on the one at the very top, hold down your shift key and click on the one at the bottom and say open. And you'll see that it's got a whole series of, uh, of um, um, uh, it's just loaded these into here and we should be good to go. Is this working for everyone? Okay, great. And then simply say, okay. Boom. Go in and take a look at this. It is, you won't find the seams in this. It is like flawless. A couple of things that you should note about this. Well, the first one is because see all this jagged edge that I've got on the top? The reason that exists is because he did not put his camera on a tripod and then level the lens out. So as he's panning across, his camera is actually traveling from it's looking down more. And as he starts to come across, he starts to look up higher. And that's why you get this like shift on the bottom and on the top. So in old, so but again, a couple of other things to notice here is you uh, come across this image. I want everybody to start to sort of like go through these things to take a look and sort of see what's happening. If you hold down your option key and you click on the eyeball, it'll turn off everything except that one image and you can see what it's actually done. It has made these masks, again, all the original 
still there. They're all just masks, but they've got these hyper-organic masks that have been put on here that allow for this seamless blending. What they're trying to do right now is they're trying to use two different images to actually blend the content of this part up. So they're using this to not only do a seamless, uh, 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 exposure, uh, seamless uh, blend from one to the next, but they're also trying to deal with this whole exposure variation issue. And it does a really good job. So if you click on the next one down, it'll actually come on and you'll see what it's working on. If you click the next one down, you'll see what it's working on. Then finally, if we start to come over, I'm going to continue to go over. I want you to take a look at the one that's got the river in it. Photoshop is actually smart enough to analyze the river. And it knows that between exposures on this, things moved. So what it does is it gives the priority. It actually picks a single frame that contains the entire river. So I'm on the one that is the river right here. If you hold down the option key and click on that eyeball, you'll see it was smart enough to grab the whole river in one frame because to try to put together something that has moved between frames is virtually impossible to do. So it does a really remarkable job of problems that are at the top of the bottom. Again, if you turn everybody else back on, so simply click and run your, uh, uh, your, um, your cursor all the way down the eyeballs. Uh, double click on the hand to get rid of this part. In the old days, we would actually just have to crop this out. So with the ruler showing, if you don't have your ruler showing, come up to the view menu and come down to make sure that you do have the, I'm sorry, yeah, the view menu, make sure that you do have ruler showing. You would actually click and do a drop down. You can see that this is my lowest corner is right down here in this top left hand corner. So I'm going to zoom into that area right there. I would click and drag down to I had a guideline that was sitting right on that top corner right there. Then if you look at the left side here, you'll also notice that that same corner is the one that's um, uh, uh, the furthest to the right. So I'm going to click on a guideline and drag it out here till I just make one solid corner right there. And you can see what I'm trying to do is come up with how much of this image I need to crop off to make it a solid image. So I'm going to kick back out and then, then I'm going to do the lower right hand corner over here. So it's this corner over here. So again, I'm going to zoom into this lower right hand corner. I'm going to click and drag down a line right here to get to that corner to show me that is the uh, farthest down on the bottom of the image that I can actually pick is right there. And then if we scroll up to the top, you'll see that this top left hand corner, this edge right here. Um, that's the part that I'm going to need to crop off. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to click and drag over so that I've got my four corners here to actually do a crop. And if I do this crop, it'll actually clean out all the transparent pixels. However, first I need to merge all of these into a single layer that will actually work. So I'm going to click on the very top of my layers here, hold down command, option, shift, and hit the letter E. Now I've got a complete merge of this version. If you hold down its eyeball and click and turn everybody else off, you can actually see everything now is in one single layer. Then you would go to the M key, the marquee tool. And the nice thing about this is that it's um, uh, crop tool is going to be more difficult to actually snap to these guides, but the marquee tool loves these guides. So simply come up to this corner, click and drag out, and I've got a circular marquee tool. So I'm going to say Command D to deselect. I'm going to change my circular marquee tool to the rectangular marquee tool. And again, hover right over here in the corner. It pretty much snaps to it. Drag all the way over to the other side and come down to that bottom corner. And you can see the little marching ants are tracing. They're attracted to your guidelines. They've snapped to your guidelines. Does that work for everybody? And then go to your crop tool and you will see in your crop tool it's going to actually then pick the crop tool lands right on the selection that you've made and then simply hit the uh, your return key once to get the preview return key again and that is now your panorama did that work for everyone however i think we can probably do a little bit better on this so if you've done all this throw this guy away we're going to do the, you don't need to save it, we're going to do the exact same procedure again. So up to the file menu, down to automate, down to photo merge, and inside photo merge, leave auto on, click on browse. We're going to pick those exact same seven files again and open them again. But this time we're going to add this at the very bottom, the option down here, the content aware fill transparent uh, uh, areas. How many people in this room use, have worked with content aware? Oh, hold your hand up high, be proud. Okay. Well, 
What Content Aware does is that Photoshop actually looks at areas of your image that are transparent and it analyzes it and it actually then tries to replace that based on the image itself. It tries to fill in all those areas that you'll see what it looks, you'll see what it does. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK to this. It's going to do its thing. And now what you see is this. If you've got the crop tool active, simply click on the little uh, arrow at the very top. Crop tool is actually, or this is actually showing you is that the marching ants are showing you the areas that were filled using content aware. So if you zoom into the sky up here really closely, I'm going to ask you to hit command H just to hide the marching ants. They're still there. If you hit Command H a second time, they come back they right back. But I just want that to happen so that you don't have the distraction of the marching ants. But I want you to look at the sky up here. Can you spot where the transparent pixels were filled in? If you hit Command H again, you'll see all of this area that is selected has all been added after the fact. Photoshop has added all of this. Look at the building down at the bottom part. Look what it's added down to the building at the bottom. It's actually added all of this stuff. Look at, the, um, look at the rooms that are down here at the bottom, the balconies that are down at the bottom. Again, hit Command H to hide that and tell me you can spot where that was added. Say what? Oh, on the other side, there's a huge problem. Show me. Oh, it's sort of like clicked off a little bit. Yeah. It's a small. Oh, no, 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 but you're absolutely right. And now, how would you fix that? Um, Liquify, transform, any of those things. Copy, like, from the good part exactly, and bring it into the part. All those tricks would be great. But look what it did for this. It just is a, is a first move. This is pretty impressive, right? So, um, again, if you zoom back out. You can actually see again, Command H to bring back. You'll show all the other stuff that again. So you can see it's actually done stuff in the water reasonably good, but where things fall horribly apart is right down in here where you end up with the, the uh, woods and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the edge of the dock that runs along here. So that part's not very good. Actually, the rest of the sunset though part, all of that part's good. I'm gonna hit Command D to deselect. So you have an option. Your first option would be simply to crop it out. So again, I would come down here to this. Uh, I would grab a guideline and I would bring my guideline right down to there and I know that anything from that part below I would actually have to lose. But in this case I would keep significantly more of my image than in the first version that we did this, right? The other version of this would actually try to fix this. So to try to fix this I would first duplicate this top layer and that was wrong. Oh, that's actually interesting, yeah. Not throw it away, duplicate it. Uh, I'm gonna get rid of that guideline because it's only gonna be distracting for me. So up to the view menu, down to clear guides, and gets rid of it. I'm gonna zoom into this area right down here and we're gonna finesse this a little bit and it's a little too tight. So I've gotta pick some place where I feel like I can join what's going on in here. And so for me, I'm gonna start it off pretty much I think I'm going to go after this area right here. We'll see what it looks like. And anyway, uh, so I'm going to hit the S key to get uh, the clone stamp tool. Uh, normal blending mode, 100% opacity, 100% flow. I'm going to make sure my brush is at least a medium hard brush. Mine is. I'm going to say OK to that. And then I'm going to sample right here on the dock line. Again, I'm trying to get something sort of that's got a little bit of green grass on this stuff and then goes to trees. The trees actually may help me out in doing this blend. So I'm going to start here, hold down the Option key and click to set my sample point. Come over here. Now, in my case, I don't have a preview. Do you guys all see, like, does your clone stamp guy have a preview in it? And doesn't that make it really hard to know where you want your target to be, where you want to start this guy? Because you can't see it right to change that behavior and this is the last thing we'll do and then we'll take a break to change that behavior come up to your window menu 
down to clone source and a window will open up and it's this thing right here this show overlay if you turn on show overlay then you will actually see it actually does show the overlay in in some people's cases that it might actually work better for you in my case it actually might work better for me so i think i might leave it on um, but this allows you to turn it on and off you can also set a 50 50 or you can set any opacity for it so you can sit on this and you can drop it down and it'll actually let you see both areas at the same time so this is all coming from the clone source uh, dialog box that's going on right here. Um, so in my case, I've turned it back on. I'll keep it that way. I'm just going to get rid of this because I'm seeing too much. And then again, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to try to line up the edge of the dock with everything else. And I'm going to click once and then simply come out and start to paint. Now it's giving me a relatively hard line, all of which I'm willing to accept here. Um, I'm going to have to blend in the water. I can actually spot the water pretty good. And I'm getting a repeating pattern here, but nobody really knows that part entirely for sure. So that would be the way I would deal with it. I would change one of these boats. The fact that the docks are the same, I can get away with. The fact that the boats are identical, I can't get away with that. So I would probably, again, just sample down in my water down here and kill this boat or something like that. You guys get where this is going. Um, and I would go in, soften up these lines, probably use the brush to go in with a tonal layer to actually blend this in a little bit better. But now I've extended my panorama to the full Monty. Are there questions about this? Are we good on that part? Um, okay, guys, so I have got 10.30. If you could be like a quarter to that'd be great. We've got a few more things to get through, and then I swear to you we're jumping into branding. Check.